The Iron Game Chalk Talk Podcast is brought to you by the following sponsors. EliteForm.com, IgnitionAPG.com, PlayUSA at PLAEUSA.com, and Soranex Exercise Equipment at Soranex.com. And now, the Iron Game Chalk Talk Podcast. Welcome to Iron Game Chalk Talk with your host, Ron McKeever. Every time our athletes walk into this weight room, they're going to be pushed to the max. Let's go! Let's go! Everything you got! On this podcast, hear Coach McKeever's straight talk about training, featuring the top strength and conditioning professionals from around the world. And now, here's your host, Ron McKeever. Hey guys, welcome back to Iron Game Chalk Talk. I'm your host, Ron McKeefrey, and this is episode number 120. Iron Game Chalk Talk is a weekly podcast where I bring you experts in the field to talk shop. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to us on iTunes or YouTube or join the mailing list at ronmckeefrey.com to stay up to date with the latest guests and anything else that I have going on. This week, excited to have Mike Favor with us. Mike is the director of Olympic sports at the University of Michigan. A great guy, been named strength coach of the year. Uh, been in you know uh, Olympic training centers and and around the world and um, just an eclectic guy that has tons and tons of things to offer um, both from a technical uh, strength conditioning side of things but also in that manager type role where he's leading a big department um, he's got some great nuggets in there um, and how he's been able to build his his structure and things along those lines so we get into that, we get into uh, his experiences working with combat athletes, wrestling and judo and things along those lines, and um, like I said, there's just a ton of great information in this episode, so I know you're going to enjoy it. Before we get started, we want to make sure we recognize all of our sponsors, Play Us, PlayUSA.com, Sornex.com, IgnitionAPG.com, and of course, uh, Elite Form, and uh, you know, I really enjoy uh, following Elite Form on Twitter, they, ton- they put out some great stuff. Um, and just need to see what some of these other programs are doing, how they're using the technology. And, and like I've said many times, they're, they're a game changer in my mind on being able to integrate technology seamlessly uh, into your program. So uh, I would encourage you to follow them on Twitter, uh, at Elite underscore form, and, um, and just let them know uh, when you get a chance that you appreciate them being involved with the show. Lastly, you know, the book has been out for a little over a week now. It's done phenomenal, way more than I ever, ever expected. Um, if you're unfamiliar with it or you haven't had any chance to, to uh, go and get it, CEOstrengthcoach.com. Uh, you can download a free chapter there uh, if you're still kind of on the fence about it, or you can go to Amazon, just straight to Amazon and, and order it. But um, it's, it's, been, it's become a, a, an international number one bestseller in its category and, um, you know, really just um, far exceeded anything that I ever thought um, a book written by a meathead strength coach would do. But um, check that out. I've gotten tons of praise and tons of uh, emails and, and things along those lines and, and seems to be um, hitting at the right time in terms of making sure that as coaches we work on becoming a great technician, being a great manager, and, and being an entrepreneur. And those, those three things, in my opinion, uh, lead to success in this profession. And so we talk a lot about that in the book and, and how to build out those three areas and, and tips and tactics that have, that have worked for me. So CEOstrengthcoach.com. I want to sit back, enjoy this episode, and we'll see you on the other side. All right, guys, welcome back to Iron Game Chalk Talk. Super excited to have a buddy of mine, Mike Favor, with us. Mike's the, the director of strength and conditioning at uh, Michigan uh, for the Olympic sports. And um, just a guy, we go way back, uh, spoke at a UK SCA conference a long time ago. So I think we've spoken at a couple other conferences together. And uh, a guy I respect, a guy that's doing it the right way and, and um, really doing a lot, not just for Michigan, but for the profession. So appreciate you coming on the show, man. Oh, thank you very much, Ron. Really appreciate having me. Mike, kind of go into your your, uh, your journey. I know you know you spent some time overseas. You've worked with a variety of sports. You know, pretty unique story. Kind of go into your story a little bit and what's led you to Michigan. Okay. Uh, well, I started uh, strength and conditioning. I didn't I didn't even know about the profession. And I kind of started start, started late after I got out of the army. Um, I was uh, at Arizona State University. I was 25 years old, and I just kind of I was uh, competing in powerlifting at the time, and I uh, got pointed in that direction from a college professor. 
Uh, so I started there, did two years there, starting as an undergraduate assistant and a graduate assistant, but then uh, got an opportunity from the Arizona Diamondbacks uh, during their inaugural year. Got to do a year there, uh, at which point I started looking at other jobs and everything was like master's preferred. So I figured, well, you know, I, pro baseball is going to be really tough to try to, uh, to get the time to do a master's degree. And there wasn't online stuff back then. Right. Uh, so, you yeah, know, it was back in the 90s. So I asked my wife, uh, who's been with me since I met her in Arizona State before I even knew this profession, what, what you want to do. And she wanted to go home. Uh, when she's from uh, South of Jersey, just outside of Philadelphia. So I went there, and I was fortunate enough to get, uh, land a GA position there at Temple University. Um, and then uh, within about six months, I got concurrently got a job at LaSalle as the head strength coach in football. Uh, and that was more of a part-time thing. They hadn't really had a strength coach there before. Uh, so I would spend, basically, my first team started at 530, and I would leave about 1, 130, go up to LaSalle, which is about a mile up Broad Street, um, and, uh, and then finish the day there, and then come back and do classes till about 10 o'clock at night. So a real <laughs> short day. So it's the yeah. usual strength coach hours. <laughs> so so whole, not a whole lot's changed, right? Uh, yeah, no, <laughs> true. I, I, I try to tell my guys, hey, you know, uh, you know, it, it takes a lot of hours uh, to, to get where you're going to go. Well, I was there for about you know another two years. Uh, in 2001, I got a great opportunity to go to Scotland over in Great Britain and uh, work for the Scottish Institute of Sport, uh, which is now known as the Sport Scotland Institute of Sport. It's changed then. Uh, but I had a great, it was a great opportunity to be able to travel around Europe uh, to see other uh, national programs, uh, meet with a lot of different professors from uh, different parts of the, the, the Europe, uh, European continent. Uh, and I also got to work with a lot of sports I didn't know much about. I got to spend a lot of time with the national program for uh, judo. I worked with badminton. I got track and field, a lot of time with rugby, uh, as well as with the, you know swimming and um, you know, other sports. Uh, but I also got to kind of build the program for the western part of the country. So I got to set up about, you know, five or six different satellite centers because uh, that's what they did. You know, they have an academy system, not so much a collegiate system like we have. Right. So these kids get in there, I want to say maybe, you know, between, depending on the sport, anywhere from 9 to 12, they'll get in these academy programs. And they're usually located in specific areas. Uh, so we would set up a small weight room or a bigger one and uh, we'd get these kids to come in and train and I would put uh, strength coaches in there. Uh, so it gave me a lot of management opportunity because I would travel around all these places and, and make sure they're running good. And I'd have to, you know, to, you know develop coaches because it really wasn't, it just was in the infancy stages over in Scotland. And the English Institute of Sport didn't even exist at the time either. So there were strength coaches. It just wasn't a formal uh, profession like what we have here. Right. Uh, but it was an excellent opportunity. And I met some great people that helped develop me. And that's kind of where I really got to develop um my craft and uh, kind of become a strength coach that I am now. Um, and then uh, after about two and a half years there, I got an incredible opportunity to go to the United States Olympic uh, Training Center in Colorado Springs, uh, where I uh, became kind of the, became the national coach for uh, Greco-Roman wrestling and uh, uh, judo for all their strength and conditioning needs. Uh, I also got an opportunity to work with the men's uh, uh, volleyball team until they moved to I think they moved to L.A. Um, and then, uh, then I ended up taking over freestyle wrestling and the women's freestyle wrestling program as well. And uh, there I really got immersed into uh, the combat sports, um, especially, specifically wrestling, and uh, really just uh, got to learn from some great people, from you know, like Steve Frazier, Olympic gold medalist, Momir uh, Petkovic was an Olympic gold medalist, um, and then all the other coaches that are out there that, that come in and come out, and uh, all the athletes and the veteran athletes that allowed me to you know, kind of uh, learn a lot more about the sport, including getting on the mat with those guys and getting beat up on a regular basis, <laughs> which was, <laughs> was fun, I guess, you know, uh, but, but I got to kind of feel you know what they're going to be going through, uh, the different throws, um, and uh, you know spend the time out there finding out the physical demands. Now you know I, I could read it up on it, and I had a pretty good idea, but I to, to get put, to get out there and get the feel of it uh, gives you a different perspective. Absolutely. Um, I spent like five and a half years there doing that, uh, being able to travel with them to uh, world championships, to the Olympics, uh, just you know be there on the mat when they win an Olympic gold medal. Uh, it, it was just uh, it's just uh, it was an honor to be able to to, to work with such uh, great individuals. Absolutely. And then that led you to Michigan. Oh, absolutely. Then I got a really great opportunity uh, just uh, six years ago. I just finished my sixth year here uh, to come to Michigan and uh, become the director of Olympic sports strength and conditioning and kind of build a program. And uh, I got 
uh, here, and there's only a couple full times the time. Uh, so you know, it was really in its infancy as far as uh, building the program to what we have now, which we've got. You know, we've got nine full times. I have two GAs and two fellows, uh, which we previously called uh, professional interns. But to kind of give it the, the respect that the positions actually do, because most of these people have uh, their master's degree already and probably have already been a GA, and may even have been a strike coach elsewhere, and are right. just kind of in between jobs um, and really looking to. to to help a program, so we, we call them fellows, just like our uh, sports medicine staff. And uh, but we've uh, we built a structure here. You know, like I said, I'm the director. Uh, Bo Sandoval is my assistant director. Uh, we have uh, f- uh, f- three head head strength coaches, and I have four assistants, and I said two GAs and two fellows. And how we structured it like that? Really, the NCAA they have a it's called the, the director's black book, but it, it has all the pay scales and, and structures of all the different positions within the NCAA. And there's really only two classifications of strength coaches that are recognized. It's head strength coach and assistant strength coach. There's football and non-football for both of those. Mm-hmm. Uh, they don't have a director, strength and conditioning, pay scale, or anything like that. So technically, I'm a head strength coach as well, and so is Bo, because um, that's our pay scale. So basically, so our, our head strength coaches will make more and have more responsibility than our assistant strength coaches who have more than the GAs and fellows. Um, and that's really how we kind of designed that. Um, I think... Uh, 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 Donnie Mabe down at Texas has got a similar system as well because he's come up and, and consulted with me, and we talk a lot as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's uh, it's helped. It's kind of you know give us a, an order of succession as well. Say if somebody leaves and moves on, we're able to uh, kind of uh, either move people into positions or we go without if we need. If we're looking for specific talent, we'll go outside and look for it as well. Sure. Well, let's let's stay into that then. You know, at what point? I mean, obviously. It's something we talk about on the show quite a bit about being, you know, a, a, to be a success. And it's what I wrote the, my the book on that I, I'm putting out. You have to be a great technician, which is, uh, you know, the, the strength and conditioning part. You know, you got to know the science. You got to be able to practically apply it. You got to, you know, you got to motivate your athletes to do it. But then the second part is, and where you really grow as a strength coach is when you become a head strength coach. All of a sudden, now you're managing time, people, resources, you know, all those things, and and so. This is a big step in that with the managing part. You know, you you identified this director's black book. You know, how did you go about kind of getting that information and then turn around and presenting that information to your athletic directors and the powers that be to say, you know what, we need to restructure this this way? Uh, Well, I was fortunate. My uh, first supervisor, uh, who's an associate AD here as well, uh, she she showed me, you know, because I was asking, like, well, well, what is what is the you know the market value of strength coach? What are we looking at here? And they, and the book really has it. it it's broken down into the, the, the Division One conferences. So you know, you get the Big Ten, you get the Big Twelve, and SEC, and so forth. And they'll they'll break it down. Uh, you know, if if they report, not every school probably reports, but most of them most of them are in there. So they'll list all like the, you know all the head strength coaches' uh, salary, not by names or anything, just for what the current one is for the, the fiscal year. And they'll list them in there, and then they'll have a and then they'll have a mean salary as well. Um, so we looked at that. And we wanted to compare and see. You know, the model here is to be leaders and best and you know we want to bring in the best talent we want to uh, we want to recruit retain and compete um, and in order to do that you know if you want to bring in the best people you also want to make sure our our our, uh, our, our pay and uh, how we treat our people is also among the best if we want them to stay we don't want people leaving for lateral positions if we're, if we're if someone's going to leave here we want to make sure that we prepared them and they're going to take a head job somewhere or something at a higher position so we had to make sure we were offering that. So she was uh, gracious enough to, to let me see that and, and see where we compared. Um, as far as structuring it like that, she was all for having a, you know, a real hierarchical uh, uh, process or kind of structure in, in it. And uh, using those, those uh, I guess, titles like head strength coach and assistant strength coach really makes sense now. I mean, you know, we're, we're currently looking at, you know, do we – maybe change those titles or something along those lines. And a lot of times my head strength coaches are also the, they're the basic the coordinator for their facility. So there's, there's argument there to maybe call it something else and just, yeah, yeah they're technically a head strength coach pay wise. Um, but we wanted to make sure that we had something that made sense. So, you know, why, why is this guy in charge of this and this guy's not? So, um, we put it in there and we have different requirements when we hire head strength coaches, you know, we have certain requirements, our assistant, 
the strength coaches have certain requirements. And uh, I mean, everybody here, if you're going to get a paid position, whether it's a temporary or full time, requires the, the NSCA CSCS certification. And of course, CPR first aid, um, and then anything that, because the the, comp, uh, the positions are comp competitive. You want to make sure that uh, anything above and beyond those qualifications are you want to help separate you from everybody else. Sure. So when it, when it's and, I, and I'm not trying to to uh, dig too deep into your personal situation, but obviously you as the director, you have a head strength coach classification. There's head strength coach and assistant strength coach. How have you made the case? And how could other strength coaches that are in similar positions make the case that, okay, I'm, I'm a head strength coach, but I'm also, I manage this entire department. So how do, how, do you, how do you present the fact that you should make more money if there's only two classifications? Uh, um, pretty much on responsibility. Here, they always ask, it's like, uh, you know, who do you oversee and how many of them there are there? It's really when they met administration, that's one of the big things they look at, you know. Well, you know, I mean, how many people are you in charge of? Do you have uh, oversight responsibilities? So with me, you know, I might constantly continue to grow. Um, and then they, when they got my initial salary, was they looked, I, they looked, I'm sure they looked at the book and kind of looked at, you know, the guy, whoever ran the departments, whatever their title was. Uh, they looked at them and they wanted to be competitive uh, with everybody else's. So I guess the argument then was, uh, well, now he's got he's got nine people. He's got a budget of X amount, which I manage, you know, a pretty good sized budget. Um, I have four four facilities that I oversee, um, and then there's 800 Olympic sports student athletes that we also have to make sure that we're providing an excellent service for. Absolutely. All right, buddy. So uh, awesome, awesome information. I, I want to go back now a little bit to your experience overseas and then like working with a bunch of different sports. And I, and I think that as a pure strength coach, um, you don't really become a pure strength coach unless you've worked with a variety of sports, you know, so that you really have to do a needs analysis. You really have to break down the movements. You really have, you have to to dive into the need, you know, what, what each athlete needs on a physical, mental uh, you know, even spiritual level. And so talk a little bit about how you were able to really grow as a strength coach by working with lots of different sports and then how you even grew. And I say this all the time, you know, when we, when, you know, when we adopted our kids from, from overseas, when we, you know, when I went to NFL Europe, went outside of the country for the very first time, uh, it opened my, my, my mind to a whole different type of, uh, of uh, thinking. You know, I went from a kind of a domestic thinking to a global you know, thinking and putting strength conditioning on a global scale. I would imagine I was probably similar for you. Talk a little bit about, you know, working with different sports and then working specifically overseas and how you grew as a strength coach. When I first got to uh, uh, Scotland, it was it was a bit of a transition. Uh, they were very, you know, more, more clinical in nature. Is that, it, uh, you know, the science, they, had, they knew the science. They were very much, uh, very sports science uh, orientated. So, uh, they weren't really on the ground like you know in America. We're really good strength coaches. We we get on the ground. We get on the floor. We're we're coaching them up. We show them how to do it. We take them through it. We're very interactive with our student athletes. And that was, that was kind of new over there. I mean, everybody was it was more of a hey, here's your instructions. Uh, this is why we do it. This is how we do it. And then just kind of let the athletes get after it. So me, I was getting in there and I was just getting, grabbing the weights and throwing around with them and uh, and taking them through everything and uh, and being you know projecting my voice, <laughs> which was uh, was different. Sure. And, uh, uh, which brought a lot there, but it also forced me to really get more into the sports science. And I had a good understanding of it, but I went to my first. Uh, sport meeting. I think it was it was judo. It was uh, we had a national uh, meeting. We were there, and everybody was putting up their uh, uh, their annual plans up on the on the projector, you know, up on the on the, uh, on the on the TV screen, and taking us through this big, huge uh, Excel based annual plan. And I'm like, ah, okay. I didn't know we we're supposed to do that. I left my thumb drive at home. So <laughs> so. When the next month one came, I had spent 30 days, I mean, really getting in there, reading everything that I could and devi devi uh, devising my own Excel spreadsheet. I mean, this is still, you know, this is a long time ago. And, I, you know, I had done, I've been doing periodization, but not with these big graphs and bars and all these different kind of uh, macros involved and volume loads monitoring. Uh, so I had... I had I had one done by the time we got to our next month, uh, and was able to do that. Um, I think my boss probably knew at the time, but he he understood, and I think that really got to me got me to 
look at it from all aspects. So I could take what they're doing with the research and better apply it, better understand it, and uh, put it in from the theoretical to the uh, uh, to the practical. Absolutely. Well, I think that uh, was a similar experience. I think you're right. I, I always say that, uh, and I've made the comment several times on the show where my experience overseas has been that it had been really clinical early on, and then you know, obviously, the practical part is what the part we're excelling. The difference is, is that you know, um, we as as American strength coaches, we need to do a much better job of getting into the science, you know, and really understanding it, and, and on, a, on a on a on a mass scale as opposed to just a period of training. And I think that's kind of what we do, but uh, I couldn't agree more. And that's something that is a great takeaway from that experience. You talked about also working with combat athletes, and you'd done a little bit, you know, wrestling growing up, but you know, not really, you know, on a, a you know, on a, a big scale at high school level or college level and things along those lines. Obviously, working with the, you know, the Scottish judo team and, and, and working with Greco and freestyle at the, at the uh, Olympic Committee has given you clout, you know, and street cred. But you know, wrestling is a, I mean, it's as, it's as tough of a sport as there is out there. It might may, maybe the toughest. And, um, you know, those guys, they can see right through a bunch of bull, you know, and they're going to, and they want to, and they want to test you too. How have you been able to kind of get buy-in from your athletes to really, you know, value you as a coach um, from both the, 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 you know, the knowledge base, but also the practical, like you can really be, be a better wrestler. Uh, well, I think my time uh, with the U S Olympic committee was Right. Uh, you know, we're a relation-based, uh, you know, relationship-based uh, uh, profession. I mean, it really comes down to, to establishing relationships and earning trust. And I was able to do that at the at the training center, and I met a lot of great people who uh, we exchanged ideas, and I learned a lot from. Who also spoke well of me. I right? think you know that that helped a lot. You know, I had people that you know that uh, you know gave testimony to, to how I was able to help them in the areas that I work with. I think that helped a lot, and the, the coaches here at Michigan have strong ties to the Olympic Training Center and those coaches who coach at the national level, uh, whether it be you know Joe McFarland, who was you know a teammate of Steve Frazier's, who, who was the uh, was the his national coach for uh, Greco Roman wrestling, uh, Zeke, Zeke Jones, who I've known from. But he was an assistant at Arizona State, and I worked with him there. Uh, but I got to work with him there and uh, help uh, design kind of the, the, the annual plans for the whole sport and the organization as well. Um, so when I came in, I had a lot of you know I've worked with this athlete and I've worked with this athlete, and they, you know, and I you know, granted I don't take credit for all their success or anything, but I did my area, which is physical preparation, and uh, and that helped. That helped to show that hey, you know, they've worked with somebody. It's not just me and they're talking. Hey, you know, I'll make you stronger and everything. Um, because, like I said, this is a very tough sport. Right? It's extremely tough. They have to be good at everything. Um, my, my, my student athletes, they have to be able to, you know, run, uh, you know, I got some of these guys are running under a five minute mile and yet got to squat twice the body weight. Right. I mean, that's, <laughs> you can, it's hard to find that in the literature. I mean, that's usually, it's like oil and water, but I have to have these guys be able to do that. They have to be powerful, they have to be strong, and they have to be able to go for a long time, whether they're, uh, whether it's a, uh, a seven-minute match or if they get overtime or if it's a, it's a, it's a three-day tournament. You know, th these guys have to be able to do that. So I have to be able to, to talk in that language, and I've, I've, I've done that with, you know, I change my cues. That the reason, we, you know, we, we teach this or that, and I'll, I'll, I'll I'll, uh, you know, put it right down to what they're doing on the mat. Same things the coaches are saying on the mat, the same stuff I'm saying upstairs. So we really speak a common language. Absolutely. What does a, you know, so you, you got wrestling in the weight room. What's a typical training session look like? Well, we'll start off, depending if, uh, if they're wrestling first, then most likely we'll, we'll go right into the workout. Uh, if they're not wrestling, sometimes they'll have a very competitive handball session. So they'll use the whole mat, it's about 50 yards worth of mat, and they'll do that. And then we'll go upstairs and we'll do kind of a specific weight training warm up really quick, just kind of get in their range of motion. It doesn't take much because these guys, are, you know, they'll go for a half hour in the, the handball. Um, and then uh, what we'll do then is we'll make sure we work on their uh, shoulder mobility. We have a, a shoulder warm up exercise that we do between PVC, PVC pipes uh, and some uh, various movements. And then we'll go in, we usually start with, uh, uh, we either have, if we have plyos in that session, we'll start with that, or the power-based uh, 
uh, free weight exercises, followed by the strength exercises. And then we'll finish with uh, more of a metabolic demanded exercises like supersets, uh, prolonged sets, circuits, uh, are there conditioning. Mm. And the sessions can go anywhere from like in season between 30 to 45 minutes up to like an hour and a half what we're doing now. And then to, you know, you know, just to kind of an overview of an annual plan, off season, they're, they're training how many days a week and what kind of split, and in season they're training how many days a week and what kind of split? Yeah, we'll start our uh, off season usually the first week of May. Um, they get done, you know, in uh, mid March, you know, from the nationals, and they get a little time. Uh, that's usually when we'll do our postseason testing. Uh, we we'll begin our first phase usually that first week of uh, of May, and we'll continue the off season up until oh, I want to say usually about mid September. Uh, we'll go into a preseason phase, which is usually three to four weeks, and that takes us from you know I want to say well, actually near the end of September and that last month of that October, and then uh, first week of November we we start we we have our uh, inter inter squad competition, and, and we usually have our first. Uh, uh, wrestling meet, which is the, the Eastern Open. <laughs> we'll go over to you guys, and right. we'll, that'll be our first competition. Um, during the off season, we'll we'll usually train about three. We, three tra we train with weights three days a week, and we condition either three to four days a week, depending on where we are. And it's usually four days a week as we get closer to the uh, school year, because that's when we really want to have the guys coming in and be in the top shape. So we don't want to come into camp and to get in shape. We want right. to come to get in shape. Uh, so we'll, we'll have them come in, at which time we'll continue to go three days a week until, like I said, about the end of September. We'll drop down to a two at that time, but then we still have, we're still having a, an additional three conditioning sessions in there as well. Um, so we march that, so we're going about five days a week of, of some sort of physical training. Uh, once the season starts, um, depending on the competition schedule, we'll go anywhere from one to two times a week for our, our starters and our guys who are probably traveling uh, due to, to uh, class commitments. And then our other guys, uh, our developmental guys, they'll continue to go twice a week because they're still wrestling four to five days a week. Right. Some of them are going twice a day due to uh, with our uh, – we have a regional training center here for USA Wrestling and it's our Olympic training site. So we have our senior level athletes here uh, and they'll usually train with them as well. Wow, well, that's fantastic. You know, earlier on you talked about managing a, a, a big staff. Now, it wasn't that way necessarily when you got there, but now you've kind of grown it to where it's, it's a pretty good sized staff with multiple facilities. How have you gone about kind of keeping everybody on the same page and with one vision? Uh, and, and that's definitely the juggling act. And I've, I went around, you know, I did a lot of site visits, um, and I still do when I travel with my teams because I want to pick people's brains and see how they've done that as well. Um, biggest thing is we have uh, we have uh, staff meetings uh, uh, biweekly, so every two weeks we'll have a, a staff meeting, and then once a month I also meet with every one of our coaches. So I get I get a personal meeting. Um, now both Sandra, my assistant director, is also getting in on that too, and, and is getting more administration. Uh, responsibilities so we do that and we also try to get everybody over here I mean we uh, we have our internship program much like yours and it's a curriculum based so we put on a lot of uh, education sessions for the for the interns that come through uh, and we involve the entire staff in that we try to get everybody over who doesn't have any sporting responsibilities at that time of the uh, day uh, get them over here at the main facility which is our can't have an auditorium facility so we're always interacting uh, it gets tough during the, you know, like the basketball time this season. I mean, it's tough on John and and uh, will be Russ this year. I mean, because they're the demands of basketball are so much that uh, they they're not always able to get over. So we get over there. We'll have our uh, our uh, staff meetings over there at the basketball facility so that they can. It's much easier for them to get in. Uh, but so we're at least twice a month we're trying to get everybody together uh, and get our, you know, get in there and then so we can talk and share ideas. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, buddy, this has been great, man. We all, we always kind of end the show with some resources here. What is the best piece of coaching advice you've ever received? Oh, the best one. I mean, it's a it's a well often used quote. I hear a lot of people say it, but uh, when I got in, I mean, I just loved weights, and I was always focused on making sure we're programming it all right and we're doing everything right. Um, but my my first boss, uh, Rich Winter, who's at Arizona State University still. I mean, he really hammered into me that you know the athletes won't care about you or your program really until they know you care about them and how they're doing and that that's where I understood that all of a sudden you know and it's not just the student athletes but it's the coaches and the administration as well uh, that you, it's a relationship business if you can get them to put their trust into you they'll they'll do all those actually they'll listen to how you coach and I think and that's really what 
really started to uh, speed up my career. So I learned, I say, hey man, this is we got to get everybody on board. We got to get consensus, and then we can then I can I can ask them to do all sorts of stuff at that point because they they trust me. They know that I'm doing this for them, and without them, I wouldn't even be there. Absolutely. What you know when you're you're interviewing staff, and like you said earlier, I mean sometimes you'll wait until you find the, the perfect person uh, to fill a spot. You know, it's it's all about culture, and it's all about finding the right fit, and, and not necessarily the best strength coach, but the best strength coach for your situation, and that would, that can work in your environment. How do you go about separating, you know, in the interview process? What's a question that you use to really kind of get to the root of somebody that really decides whether or not they're a good fit for you or not? Uh, that's 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 a great question. Uh, I have a great. Uh, they call it the talent acquisition team here, but it's our own personal HR within our athletic department. They can really they get to sift through because I give them all the all the things we're looking for. So when I get down to that final group, which is usually three to four people, I've had a couple times it's been five, um, and I know they're all highly qualified. They all have all the minimums. They have extra qualifications on top of that. So I know that every one of them probably can do. A, a great job here. Um, at that point, I want to see. I want. I want to ask a, a question. I'll dig a little deeper now. Uh, and one I always ask is that you know, why do you want to work here at Michigan? Why do you want to work? You know, and this is where it really separates a lot of guys. They may be just looking for a job, and they'll you know, like, well, hey, you know, Michigan's awesome, and I'm like, well, thank you. I, I really. I, I also share the same view. Why is Michigan awesome? And sure. this is good to see. Did they do any research? Did they try to learn anything? Did they go to the website? Did they find you know something about our traditions or the successes or the people who have been here, um, you know, or, or anything about Michigan that, that that makes it so they want to come here rather than somewhere else? Or if they had to choose between two things, and then I know I not only have a great strength coach, but I have somebody who wants to be here, wants to be part of this team, wants to be part of what we're building here. Um, so I know I have somebody that's going to. That's going to have that, what I just said, you know, they're going to care about the athletes, they're going to care about the school, care about the coaches, and, 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 and get that trust. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Give us a, um, a book, app, and website recommendation. Uh, well, uh, you know, of course, when I first started, uh, the Essential Strength Conditioning from the SCA, of course, was great because it kind of had every everything in there to give you a taste and kind of point you in the direction for other things. And that's a good book. And I think the one that really took it further was uh, the first edition of Science and Practice of Strength Training by Zatsky Orsky. Uh, that first edition, I really I really liked it. The other ones are good too, but I, I really like that first edition. Um, as far as website, um, I really like the NSCA website. I think it is, is excellent. Because uh, uh, they, they have, as a member, you have access to their, their publications just at your fingertips. So you can type in whatever the heck you're looking for, and you've got access from 1978 until the present moment. And it is fantastic. I mean, you get to see the pioneers of the field, what they've written, um, and then you get to see the people that are the pioneers of today. I mean, they're taking us to new levels. Uh, in addition to that, they have the education area where they have all these different videos. Uh, um, from people that are on the, the front lines and the trenches and the professors and, and, and the researchers of today that are actually speaking on current topics um, and uh, from the from the national conferences and such. And they, right there at your fingertips, you can click on it and, and you know if you couldn't have made it to that uh, national conference, you you can you can listen to that and uh, and, and get a good idea and maybe put you in a direction uh, that will uh, better you. Absolutely. Any any apps that you guys use regularly? Uh, we're still looking at that. Right now, we're we're looking at we're we're we're, we're using a uh, Volt Athletic. Uh, we're gonna kind of a partnership with them, or uh, more for more so for athletes who go away in the summer. Sure. So our women's soccer team used it this year. Uh, so we have our workouts and we put it into their software, and uh, it allows them to uh, it, you know not only has the workout in there, but then it also has a video demonstration and uh, pictures of the lift so every one of them so when the athlete goes away they can check in go right off their their uh, iphone or their their samsung or whatever it is and uh look go right in there see everything that we programmed out for them um and follow it right along which is a kind of a new thing i think next year we'll have uh we'll have our track and field teams on it because a lot of those guys will go away as well or travel and uh, i think we're slowly getting more into that uh, we're looking at different ways of uh uh, analyzing and assessing and monitoring our training loads uh, as well, but we can't haven't quite found the right one yet because there's like uh, some of them will do like you know, three quarters of what we need, but right. that one quarter is really important too. And then there's <laughs> one that does the one quarter, but not three quarters. So we're really we're working on that. We're really uh, investigating at the point, but 
we do these, uh, you know, uh, 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 dart fish and, and several other things like that. Well, that's fantastic, man. Well, this has been awesome. There's tons of tons of great nuggets in here. Easy to see why you've been such a, a, a big success in the field, man. I, I appreciate you coming on the show and sharing with everybody, buddy. Hey, no problem. Thank you very much. It's been a great opportunity. That's it for this episode of Iron Game Chalk Talk. Thanks to this week's guest as well as our sponsors for bringing this episode to you for free. Make sure to check out ronmckeefree.com where you can join our mailing list, find the show notes, including all the links and resources mentioned, and information about Coach McKeefree's other products. While you are there, please join Coach McKeefree in the comments section thanking our guest for sharing. If you haven't subscribed to Iron Game Chalk Talk on YouTube or iTunes yet, make sure to do so. Comments, ratings, and reviews are always welcome. Coach McKeefree can be found on Twitter at rmckeefree on Facebook and YouTube at forward slash Ron dot McKeefer. That's it for this week. Be sure to check back next week for another great episode of Iron Game Shop Talk.